In this short video, we're going to talk about special functions which have been derived in order to solve special differential equations. So if we have some special differential equations, for example, there's Bessel's equation of order nu. So this symbol here, which looks like a script V, is actually the Greek letter nu. And that's x squared y double prime plus x y prime plus the quantity x squared minus nu squared times y equals zero. Another special differential equation is Legendre's equation of order n, which is written as one minus x squared times y double prime minus two x y prime plus n times n plus one times y equals zero. In our study, we're going to focus on Bessel's equation. So Bessel's equation is very common. It has a singular point, a regular singular point at x equals zero. So we actually know how to solve this particular equation. We'll start off by assuming the solution has a infinite series which has the exponent n plus r. We take its derivative, its second derivative, substitute into the equation, factor out x to the power of r. So this is exactly the technique that we use to find solutions about regular singular points. And so the next thing I can do is I can say, all right, notice that every one of my series except for the third one starts with x to the power of zero. The third one starts with x to the power of two. And to perform my analysis, I need all of the series to start with the same power. So I'll have to have them all start with x to the power of two. And so the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to write the powers of x, let me say the coefficients or the terms corresponding x to the power of zero and to x to the power of one outside of the summation notation. And that's what I've done here. The terms corresponding to x to the power of zero, uh, they are all multiplied by c naught. So I get an r minus one times r from the first series, just an r from the second series. And then from the fourth series, I get a minus nu squared. And then the coefficients corresponding to x or x to the power of one are in this set of brackets. Now the rest of my summation series Three of them start at n minus two, one starts at n equals zero, but the power of x is always starting at x to the power of two or x squared. Well, we should be able to look at the terms multiplied by c sub zero to get the initial equation. And that gives me two different values of r, r equals nu or r equals minus nu. And in either case, if I were to substitute the r value into the expression multiplied by c1, I would get something which is not zero, which means c1 has to equal zero. So now we know c1 equals zero. We know that our values of r are nu or minus nu. I'm left with writing all of these summations uh, to start with the same index and have the same power on x. So the only one that I have to modify is the one that starts with n equals zero. So I'd like it to start with n equals two, which would mean then that uh, my power on x would be x to the power of n, but then I have to shift the index on the coefficient to be c sub n minus two. So let's go ahead and do that. So instead of starting with n equals zero, 
I'm now starting with n equals 2. Now my power on x is x to the n, and my coefficient is c sub n minus 2. So I could uh, then look at what would be the coefficient, or what would be multiplied by c sub n. It would be this relationship here. And then I would have this other term, c sub n minus 2. And from this, I can get a recurrence relationship. Uh, I'll get a different recurrence relationship depending upon if I have nu or negative nu in the place of r. And then here's an important fact that since we have a recurrence relationship where c sub n depends on c sub n minus 2, that would mean c sub 3 would be a multiple of c sub 1, but we saw c sub 1 is 0. So that means that all of the odd indexed coefficients are going to be 0. So again, we have a recurrence relationship, and we know that c sub 1 equals 0, and in fact, all the odd numbered coefficients are zero, so we're left with the even-numbered coefficients. So if n is an even number, we can write it as 2 times k, where k is an integer. And so here is our relation. And normally, we would, if we were just writing a solution, we could just leave it in this form. We could just say we're going to get an infinite series. We'll have uh, the odd numbered coefficients equal to zero, and here's the recurrence relation for the even numbered. But in this case, we're going to actually work on getting a formula for the coefficients. So let's just look at some of the even numbered ones. They're all going to depend on c naught, and then it's going to be some multiple of c naught. And we can see that where we're going to as we write out these that we do have a 4 that starts here. Uh, and then we should have oh, 8 times 24. Uh, that is, let's see here, is that the same as 4 times 3 times 2 times 1? Um, might have needed to be four times. That should be good. Eight times three. Twenty-four is four times six. Sometimes I get lost here with this, this algebra. So I know I'm going to have, so k equals 3. I'm going to have k factorial. The sign on the terms is alternating, so that's why I can write it as negative 1 to the power of k. I'm going to have this 2 squared, which is the 4 that's written here. And then the, the difficult part is the fact that I have this product of binomials. So I have nu plus k times nu plus k minus 1, all the way down to nu plus 3 times nu plus 2 times nu plus 1. So it's a little bit awkward. So we're going to take a slight detour to find a more compact way of writing that. And we're going to talk about the gamma function. And the gamma function is an integral defined function. So in this integration, we're integrating with respect to t. The x is considered a constant when we perform the integration. And the gamma function has many interesting properties, but the one that we are interested in is the following. If I look at gamma of x plus 1, and I just look at the definition, so now instead of t to the power of x minus 1, I have t to the power of x. And I can perform this integration 
by use, integrating by parts. Remember, x is considered a constant, so I can just use the power rule when I'm integrating or, or differentiating t to the power of x. And then this is an improper integral, and remember how we evaluate improper integrals is to replace the infinity sign by some parameter and let the parameter go to infinity. So I will be replacing it by b, and then I'm going to take the limit as b goes to infinity. Well, let's look at this. Uh, we get two terms from integration by parts. Here's our uv, and then this is minus integral v du. Well, the first term is going to go to zero. As uh, b goes, when I evaluate this, uh, when I put in uh, remember, these are values of t. When I put in t equals 0, uh, for my bottom limit, it's going to be 0. When I put in t equals b, I'll have e to the negative b power times b to the x. So I have a power of b times the exponential with a negative b index or exponent, and that's going to dominate and you could verify that by using L'Hopital's rule. But anyway, this first term goes to zero as b goes to infinity. And then in the second term, the integral term, what I have in the integral is just gamma of x. I have the x multiplying on the outside. So gamma of x plus 1 equals x times gamma of x. So some people say that, oh, the gamma function is an extension of the idea of factorial to real numbers. Because if I had uh, x equaling a positive integer, I would actually say that gamma of x is n factorial. So how can this help us with our solution to Bessel's equation? Well, we had these nu plus uh, k terms. And so if I use this recurrence property of the gamma function, I can see that gamma of nu plus k is actually the product of these binomial terms, nu plus k minus 1 plus nu or times nu plus k minus 2 all the way down to nu plus 2 times nu plus 1 times gamma of nu plus 1. So that should help us write our coefficients in a more compact form. So what do we have? We've got a recurrence relationship for the even values of n. The odd values or the odd coefficient, odd numbered coefficients are all 0. We have an expression in our recurrence relationship with the nu plus k times nu plus k minus 1 all the way down to nu plus 1. But we know that that can be expressed in terms of gamma functions. And to make it even cleaner, there's a standard choice for c naught. Remember, c naught's arbitrary. So we're going to choose c naught to have this form. So we're going to have uh, 1 over 2 to the power of nu times gamma of 1 plus nu. This would be the same as gamma of nu plus 1. And so we can also say that, oh, okay, if I'm going to start at nu plus k and take that product, so this expression which appears in the denominator, that can be written as the ratio of two gamma functions, but because our choice of C naught includes gamma of 1 plus nu, then we can write our coefficients using the gamma function so for both nu and negative nu, which means our series solution going to have those coefficients. Because I have this 2 uh, in the uh, denominator and my r value is nu, uh, then, and this is only going to be valid for even uh, coefficients. So 
thus far we have changed the index to k. And now instead of having n plus nu, which would be n plus r, I have 2k plus nu. And those solutions are called Bessel functions, right? specifically Bessel functions of the first kind. We use the letter uppercase J with a subscript nu to represent those series, or subscript minus nu if we have selected R equals minus nu. We know that uh, under most conditions, uh, we are going to have linearly independent solutions. And so, um, what can we say? Well, if nu equals zero, they're not linearly independent. One, they're actually identical. But if uh, the difference between nu and negative nu is not an integer, or there's a special case, if nu actually has the form of an odd integer over two, we'll still have the difference being an integer, but in this both cases, these two solutions are linearly independent. Now, it's often convenient to use a second type of Bessel function. It's just a linear combination of the Bessel functions of the first kind. Uh, we're going to have to have nu be not an integer, because if it were an integer, this function would not be defined, because the denominator is sine of nu times pi. And if nu is not an integer, then the j sub nu and the y sub nu are linearly independent solutions. And so, again, uh, we, we can have a linear combination of j sub nu and y sub nu as our general solution. But even when nu is equal to an integer, we can define a function y sub m in terms of the limit as nu approaches m of y sub nu. And uh, we can show that this limit is going to exist and so even when we have a uh, new equal an integer, we can find or use these y sub m and j sub m as solutions to Bessel equa Bessel's equation. Uh, some properties for integer values of m, uh, we can say that j to the j sub minus m is negative one to the m of j sub m. So when uh, m is an integer, that shows us right away that j sub minus m and j sub m are not linearly independent, but that's why we're going to use j sub m and y sub m. Uh, if I replace x with negative x, I get negative 1 to the power of k. Uh, I think I probably wanted to have m here. Make a quick correction. Because what we're trying to say here is that when m is even, then the Bessel function is an even function. If m is odd, the Bessel function j sub m is an odd function. Uh, its initial value or the value when uh, x equals zero is going to be zero for all values of m, except for m equals zero when it equals one. And then these Bessel functions of the second kind behave like a log function in the sense that as you approach zero from the right, the value of the Bessel function approaches negative infinity. We also have some differential recurrence relationships. So differential meaning having to do with the derivatives. So we have this relationship between the derivative of j sub nu and j sub nu and j sub nu plus one. 
And so you could really think of this as being a first order differential equation uh, in terms of J sub nu. So, and if we wanted to try to solve that, we could try to use an integrating factor of X to the power of negative nu. And we could also use, uh, get a different relationship if we had uh, negative nu instead of uh, positive nu. So I think that I can have a little typo here. This should be negative nu. All right. And so there's many variations of Bessel's equations that we can solve by just making some appropriate changes of variables. So for example, if I use t equals alpha x, uh, then instead of having x squared, I could have alpha x squared minus nu squared. So we get a variation uh, or a parametric form of Bessel's equation. And uh, there's no surprise that after you make that substitution, you get uh, the proper or original Bessel equation, but with t squared. So the solution is just still going to be a linear combination of j and y, but now instead of having x, we have alpha x, because we had t equals alpha x. Uh, if I look at an equation uh, where I write it in this form, if I were to distribute the minus sign, this would say that I would have plus negative x squared plus or minus nu squared. So it would be uh, that parametric form, but where we had alpha squared equals negative one, which means that I would have to make the change of variable t equals ix and proceed as before. And we would get a solution just like we did before. But the only concern here is that since I have ix as the input to the Bessel functions, the output is going to have uh, imaginary numbers in it. And we'd like to have a solution which only has real numbers. And we can do that using some identities and some algebra. And it'll be convenient for us to define uh, some modified Bessel functions. The first one is going to be written using an uppercase i. And what we do is we take, this is supposed to be a j, if that's not clear. We take the original Bessel function, which was being evaluated at ix, and we multiply that times i to the power of negative nu. That results in a modified Bessel function, but whose output is only real numbers. And that's our modified Bessel function of the first kind. Just like we did with the original Bessel functions, we're going to take a linear combination of this uppercase i function, and we'll get a modified Bessel function of the second kind. And then we can express our general solution in terms of these modified Bessel functions for this form of the Bessel equation. And of course, instead of having x squared, I could have an alpha x squared. And the only thing that means is that my solution will have alpha x as the input argument. So let's uh, actually solve some Bessel equations. Uh, to see this as a Bessel equation, I'm going to first divide every term by 16. And then I see now I have x squared minus 1 over 16. So 1 over 16 is nu squared, meaning nu is plus or minus 1 fourth. And my solution then would involve the Bessel function j sub 1 fourth and j sub negative 1 fourth, some linear combination of those. Now here I have a modified version. Instead of having x squared, I have 9x squared minus 4. So nu squared equals 4. Nu is going to equal 2. 9 is going to be my alpha squared, so alpha is going to be 3. And so now I can take that uh, as a linear combination of my uh,
Bessel function of the first kind and Bessel function of the second kind. And then now the input argument instead of x is going to be 3x. And in our last example, we're going to work out a solution to this equation, which uh, almost looks like a Bessel's equation, but there's no y prime term here. Uh, so we're going to make a change of variables, and this is given to us. You didn't have to determine that. We're given that we're going to use the change of variables y equals radical x times u of x. And so let's go ahead and calculate the first and second derivative. And we'll make a substitution now using the expression for the second derivative in the original uh, equation. And we'll also replace y with radical x times u. Now when I rearrange my terms here, I have what multiplied through by x. Uh, you can see now that I have a u double prime, I have a u prime, and then I still have uh, something times uh, radical x times u. Now you can see that I have minus one fourth radical x times u and then plus one fourth radical x times u. So that one fourth part is going to add away to make zero. Now I've got a uh, Bessel's equation, one of the parametric forms in terms of u. So we can get a solution in terms of u. u is just going to be a linear combination of the Bessel functions uh, with index nu and whose input argument is alpha x. And what I'd like to do then is to get a solution in terms of y. And because of my change of variables, all I need to do then is multiply my solution in terms of u by radical x.